Okay, a little behind the scenes uh, work there. Let's go ahead and officially get started. Welcome to the Recruiting Attracting Successful VISTAs webinar. This is the first webinar in a new series for VISTA supervisors. I'm Amy Kanata with Education Northwest in Portland, Oregon, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We have a team supporting this webinar today. To start with, I want to welcome Eric Powell from the Corporation for National and Community Service. Take it away, Eric. Thank you, Amy. On behalf of the Corporation for National and Community Service, celebrating 20 years since 1993, and the AmeriCorps VISTA program, welcome to the first webinar in our series. We're extremely excited about the turnout and the number of people who are interested in this webinar, as well as future webinars down the line. We designed this VISTA Supervisor webinar series based on topics of interest to you as you're doing recruiting and interviewing and all the things you need to get successful VISTAs. We certainly encourage your feedback about this and our other webinar topics. About once a month, you'll have an opportunity to participate in a webinar on a different topic by signing up and participating with others. Thank you again for joining us today, and without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Amy to get us started with the presentation. Thank you, Eric. So, um, some tips for participating today. As many of you, of you have probably noticed, the phone lines are muted, and we do have over 100 people online, so that's just to keep the background noise down. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions or would like to share something, you can type your questions into the chat panel. And just be sure to send those to all participants so that everyone can see what you're sharing or asking. You can also raise your hand if you would like us to unmute your phone at any point. Um, we'll probably be stopping when it makes sense naturally within the presentation, but we'll certainly have time towards the end for Q&A. We've left a good amount of time for that. And if you feel more comfortable asking questions verbally, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll be relying on the chat panel to interact. Um, we'll also be using some annotation tools during the session, and I'll explain how to use those when we get to them. And finally, uh, this session is being recorded. We will be posting the recording, in case you want to share it with others, to the VISTA campus page, the one called Webinars for Supervisors. And we'll also be posting all of the tools on that page, so anything that we share uh, or mention today you'll be able to access on that page. And that will be uh, probably within about 48 hours the tools will be available. And probably about a week we'll be able to have that recording up there available for folks. And that's the same page that you accessed when you registered for the session. So let me go ahead and introduce our team for today. Our core team, um, myself, Eric Powell, who you already heard from, and our colleague, Lois Morgan, who's at Bank Street College of Education in New York. So we have a true bi-coastal partnership here. And Lois is going to be monitoring the chat and um, helping us answer questions. So you'll hear her pop on a little bit later. And then we have three guest speakers today. We have Yalisa Negron from Siena College. Jenny McArdle from Michigan Nonprofit Association, and Tracy Johnson from the Corporation for National and Community Service. Yulisa is the Associate Director of Academic and Community Engagement at Siena College. She's a former VISTA, a former VISTA leader, and now a VISTA supervisor. Her program is comprised of 30 VISTAs, two VISTA leaders, and one coordinator. Ginny is the Program Manager for the Michigan Nonprofit Association of Civic Engagement AmeriCorps VISTA program. She's also a former VISTA and former VISTA leader. And this program is comprised of 28 VISTAs, two VISTA leaders, and 23 sub-site supervisors across the state of Michigan. And we also have Tracy Johnson from the Corporation for National and Community Service. Tracy is a recruitment, marketing, and outreach specialist at the corporation. She was first introduced to national service as an AmeriCorps VISTA member with Teach for America. So please welcome all of our wonderful guest speakers, and you'll be hearing more from them a little bit later. Let's go ahead and launch in to what we want to do today. So we're looking at um, 
a very focused piece of recruitment. We realize that recruitment is a big topic. We could probably spend all six of our webinars just on recruitment. But for today, we want to look at the interpersonal competencies that make a successful VISTA, so getting the right person in the door, the VISTA recruitment cycle, as well as tools and systems to help facilitate and streamline that process. And then we also want to spend some time talking about common challenges and solutions. And we did collect all of your questions uh, and challenges, and we are hoping to address some of those. We have some themes when we get to the challenges and solutions section. So that's what we have for today. Let's go ahead and get started with the formal part of our session. We have a little scenario for you to get started. We want you to consider these two applicants. Let's imagine that you have two top candidates for your program that's seeking a VISTA who can build partnerships, recruit volunteers, and develop programming for homeless families in your area. John is a local retired veteran who has been instrumental in building his church's volunteer program. He is not a college graduate, but brings a vast amount of life experience and local connections. April is just about to graduate with a bachelor's degree in sociology, and she's focused on social justice. She completed an internship at a local women's shelter during college, but has no paid work experience. She will need to relocate to your community to serve. Who would you be inclined to choose and why? Go ahead and use the chat panel to enter your answer. Who would you be inclined to choose, John or April, and why? Well, I'm seeing a lot of John. Um, Someone is uh, voting for April. Some people are, are balancing risky and new ideas. Lo local is a plus for some. Local connections. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's quite a balance. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, pretty close between the two candidates. Yep. Yep, and experience and riskiness and new ideas are the themes that are keep coming up. Um, Great. Well, thank you, Lois. And that was Lois who's going to be, uh, you'll hear her a little bit throughout the session, uh, summarizing some of our ideas in chat. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these ideas in more detail. The first half of today's session is really about personal competencies that VISTAs need to be successful. So let's take a look at some of these competencies that you want to consider when you're recruiting. The Corporation for National and Community Service commissioned a study with JBS International to understand and identify knowledge, skills, and attitudes that individuals need to successfully complete their VADs. The initial model was drafted by a team of workplace competency experts and a group of VISTA hosts supervisors, and members. In total, they identified six competency areas. The first one here, personal effectiveness. Academics was number two. Workplace, VISTA technical competencies, and VISTA knowledge competencies. So today we're going to be focusing on the personal effectiveness competencies. They are the foundation of what VISTAs need in order to be successful. Members are expected to arrive for service with the majority of these personal effectiveness competencies as well as the academic competencies. But in reality, they don't always have the personal skills and competencies they need to succeed. So let's dig a little deeper into this topic and learn about these strategies for identifying these personal competencies. So first of all, I wanted to show you 
Um, this is were surveyed, and these are the top five personal competencies that they said were critical when they were serving. So we have obviously working independently, taking that initiative, personal responsibility, uh, communication, listening, and ambition. And here's a little bit more of an expanded list. Obviously, there's more to these lists, um, and we'll share uh, the larger list with you will be available on the webinar page a little bit later. But this gives you an idea of what falls under those seven domains. And again, you don't have to write this down because we'll share it with you later. So take a look at these, and let's think about how these apply at our site. We have a little activity for you. Um, do certain competencies stand out for you and why? Do certain competencies stand out for you and why? And we're going to use the chat panel, and I'll go back to the competencies page so you can see the list. As you look at this list of seven and some of the bullet points underneath them, are there certain competencies that stand out for you, certain things you're really looking for? Um, competencies that you'd hoped for but have not had in your recent vistas. A couple of you have. A couple of you have said uh, willingness to learn, personal responsibility. Quite uh, several with personal responsibility, leadership, interpersonal skills, strong communication skills. Yes, these are all excellent. Intuitive initiative, cultural competency, these are all very important. Curiosity, willingness to learn, Deal, dealing with ambiguity, that's uh, an important one. Positive attitude, yes. All competency is important, at least at some level, yes. Um, ability to work with others. Empathy. Empathy is is huge. Yes, it is. A lot of these are reinforcing each other, uh, adapting to changing environments. Ambition, yes. Thank you, Lois. Um, and thank you, everyone. It's a really great to see all your ideas coming in to the chat panel. And obviously, this is a condensed list. Um, like I said, there's actually two pages that define all of these in detail that you can look at later on. But what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from some of our guest speakers who are supervisors in the field, and they're going to talk a little bit about how they look for these competencies, what kind of tools and tricks they use to look for these comp competencies and applicants that they bring into their programs. So first up is Yalisa, and I'm going to go ahead and transition to Yalisa now. Take it away, Yalisa. Thank you, and welcome everyone to this session. Um, when it comes to personal competencies, we all want a rock star VISTA that has all of these qualities. And the reality is, it can be very difficult to find a person who matches every single competency that you would like. Um, in some ways, uh, programs have to begin to think about and reflect what are really important competencies that are important to your program and what are some that are non-negotiable, you just simply have to have. With our program at Siena College, 
We have 30 VISTA fellows and two VISTA leaders, and we work with over 25 different agencies. Therefore, as anyone can imagine, we have quite a number of competencies that both site supervisors express to us about the type of VISTA they would like to see, but then we also have our own vested interest in what kind of candidate we would like to see in our program, since our program does the recruitment on behalf of all the agencies. What we've come to find out is there's a number of competencies that we find important, and so do our partners, which are listed on the screen. The first and foremost is a willingness to learn, and that's very important at this point. With the willingness to learn, what's really important is to talk about being open to the experience that they're going into. The community that we serve in Albany is a very high-need population. Whether you're working with homeless individuals, veterans, or youth, they all require a sense of willingness to be open to their experiences and allowing someone to gain new knowledge and insight of the work that they're doing, learning by both the nonprofit side and our program side. So a willingness to learn is very important. One thing that we like to make sure that candidates know coming into the program is to treat this service year as a year on rather than a year off, which is a common mentality when some college students decide to do a year of service. And to be honest, when we tell them that, they really take it into consideration that this is a real position with real responsibilities. The next area that we'd like to talk about is ambition. And really, we are talking about a VISTA's ability to stay motivated and persevere in their year of service. And part of what we've recognized that can affect motivation and perseverance in a year is really the openness and transparency of a program to let them know the expectations and requirements. We have a very dynamic program here at Siena that provides a high level of engagement to not only develop our VISTAs personally, but also professionally. And part of this um, results in a variety of different trainings, um, also social activities throughout the month, and even committee work for special events. Therefore, we really want to make sure that our VISTAs understand that our program does require a high level of engagement. And one way we've been able to translate that is actually the creation of a 15-minute program video that basically captures the ins and outs of our program. And this video was created by a VISTA leader with two other VISTAs. And in 15 minutes, they get a really great short rundown about our program and really helps to capture everything that we're about. We send that video to our candidates before they come into the interview with us so that during their Q&A, they can ask specific questions. We have found that as a result of this video, candidates have less confusion of our program, have a higher satisfaction going into the program knowing the next steps and what is their engagement, but also allows them to really understand what they can get out of the program and to identify if this is a great fit for them. Last but not least, personal responsibility. Particularly, this is talking about a VISTA's attitude and behavior. We meet a variety of different candidates, and in our program, we receive over 150 applications. And it can be difficult to really understand how a VISTA can, can fit into a nonprofit, and particularly into a VISTA assignment description of a particular agency. Therefore, we've learned to really focus a lot of our questions in our interview process around behavioral questions. Particularly why we like to do this is really because of the population that's being served, but also helping to understand different aspects of their personality that we may not know through an application, such as a candidate's work ethic, their ability to be sensitive with the community that they're serving, possibly even their characteristics in their work ethic that may, may or may not work with their supervisor. And those are just a few examples. So some behavioral questions that we like to ask Tell me about a time that you experienced a conflict with a supervisor. How did you handle the situation, and what were the outcomes of this? What did you learn? The ability to ask these open-ended questions and allow the VISTA candidate to share stories with us has, a, has given us more opportunities to understand if they would be a great fit with our program, but in particular, the position that, they're, that we're thinking about at the nonprofit. And last but not least, I would really encourage compromise and flexibility. It's important that as you're thinking about these competencies, really reflect if these are areas that you actually need, or is, is there an ability for you to train a candidate on how to do a specific, uh, specific characteristic, such as if you need a great public speaker because they're doing a lot of outreach. Is that something that you can train on, or is that must be a must and you, need, you can train on other, other areas? 
Um, so for that, that kind of comp that establishes really what our program is about and personal competencies. And now I'll turn it over to Jenny where she can share her insights. Okay, thanks, Yulitsa. Um, like Yulitsa mentioned, our program shows that we have a commitment to our communities and to our partners when we place a VISTA in the field who will be able to excel in some of these personal competencies. And three that we found are really important to us, to our partners and our communities, are interpersonal skills, initiative, and adaptability and flexibility. So we do have questions that we ask all of our VISTA candidates to try to pull out of them their experience and ability in these competencies. But we also found that we often learn more from their references rather than the potential VISTA themselves who might find it hard to talk about their personal competencies. So I'd recommend to everyone to follow up with VISTA candidates' references, either in eGrants where they are notified automatically to fill out a reference form or if someone comes through on a resume, do follow up with those references because sometimes those references find it easier to talk about a candidate's competencies than the candidate itself. Um, so the first competency that we focus on is interpersonal skills. And here we like to see a VISTA who is not only strong in communication, like public speaking or writing, but also is able to work with a variety of people and will be able to operate successfully in an office setting. So we like to ask things like if they're working on a team and some team members aren't pulling their weight, what are some things that this VISTA candidate can do to motivate others? We also look at what sort of activities they've been involved in whether it's in their AmeriCorps portal application or on their resume, because the diversity of activities indicates to us that they've been involved with a variety of people, and we like to see that ability to interact with a variety of communities. We also look at a VISTA's initiative. The reality for our program is that while these VISTAs will be placed at a host site, they're often the only one really pushing a project forward, and they'll have some supervision, but they need to be able to take initiative on their own. So we do ask questions about how VISTA candidates stay organized, how they handle pressure, and we ask for some examples of times where they took the initiative to get something done. So we like to see someone who will really be able to drive a project forward without having their hand held every step of the way. And along with this, we like to share with the VISTA candidate what their supervision plan is going to be. Some of our sites have a more hands-on supervisor and some are more hands-off. At some sites, the VISTA will be working with another VISTA member or another national service member, and sometimes they'll be really independent. So I want to lay out ahead of time what the work environment is going to be like so the VISTA candidate can be prepared for that and be able to speak effectively about how he or she can effectively work in that environment. Finally, we look for adaptability and flexibility because oftentimes the VISTA work plan changes over the course of the year, or one partnership doesn't work out and the VISTA has to go with a different partnership. And so we need some level of flexibility in being able to handle a dynamic environment. So we ask some questions about how they have successfully multitasked, how they will handle different living environments. Some of our sites are very rural and kind of isolated, so we want someone who's going to be able to handle a rural situation. We also want to know how this person is going to be able to live on a VISTA stipend, which could be a big difference for some people's um, what they're used to living on. With this, we like to be really honest and realistic about what our program needs. For some of our sites, um, particularly the rural ones, a vehicle is really required if the VISTA needs to travel around a city. And so rather than beating around a bush, we need to ask them up front, can they use a vehicle or can they navigate public transportation? At some of our sites, we expect our VISTA members to be able to work some weekends or some nighttime hours. So we want to ask them up front whether they're comfortable with these hours. We think it's better to ask these up front, like I said, rather than surprising a VISTA who might really not know what he or she's getting into. And we want to make sure that they are prepared ahead of time so they can successfully complete a year of service. So like Gilitsa said, we feel that all of these competencies are important, but these three in particular are ones that we focus on, and we talk to both the VISTA candidates and our references to try to gauge the candidates' abilities in these areas. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Amy. Great. Thank you, Yulisa and Jenny. I think some really great tips and sort of unpacking how different programs are approaching the competencies with their applicants.
Okay, so let's just summarize what we just heard. Um, here are some top ways that you can learn about personal competencies in the application uh, time period. Keeping in mind how they respond uh, during the application period, how they respond to requests, do they keep in touch, are they providing high quality materials, and are they providing everything that you've asked for, and are they generally engaged in the application process. Also, um, how they respond during your interview. Have they done their, their background homework? Are they asking good questions? Are they giving you thoughtful responses? Or are they giving you sort of canned responses? And then also taking a look at their work history and asking some deep questions when you talk to those uh, uh, references that they provide for you. And again, um, we will be posting and sharing some resources online, some of which are sample questions from uh, Yulitsa's program that she uses during the interview process. So you will get some sort of hands-on resources that you all can use at your site, so maybe compare to what you're currently using for some fresh ideas. So here we are again, back to John and April. Now that you've had a chance to learn about some of the personal competencies, what else would you want to know about these candidates before you choose your finalist? Go ahead and use the chat panel to enter your ideas. What else would you want to know about John and April to choose your finalist? So past experience and education are important, but they're only part of the picture as we know. Getting candidates with a high number of personal competencies in the door is crucial, like you've heard. Many of the VAD-related tasks that we're looking for can be taught or trained with VISTAs, but they have to really show up and be able to work independently, to listen carefully, and have the ambition to stick with it for the whole year. So keep these competencies in mind when you think about who you want to target for your recruitment. Targeting a broad range of candidates can pay off, so it might all be a different pool of people or a different a resource where you post your opportunities. And again, the characteristics and past experiences of your most effective VISTAs may surprise you. You just never know. So Lois, what do we see and come through the chat panel? Well, we're seeing a lot of uh, what their motivation is, what their goals are, commitment to service, uh, their reasons for being interested, um, I'm seeing a lot of variations of those themes, um, their expectations, their, their interest to their career paths. Great. Okay, well, I think we've definitely dipped our toe in, at least, so to speak, into the personal competencies, and I think it's probably given everybody some a different perspective, maybe, uh, some different things to think about when they're reaching out and screening their applicants. So let's go ahead and move on to the second big topic area that we want to look at today, and that's the stages of the VISTA recruitment process. The graphic that you're seeing now was adapted from a graphic that was developed by a group of VISTA leaders who were working on a recruitment challenge for supervisors. And this was created based on their own experiences as well as input from the field. And they worked on this all summer. They worked very hard on it. The team was also tasked with creating a set of tools and resources that goes along with this cycle, and we'll take a look at some of those in a minute. But I also want to acknowledge again that um, there are a variety of approaches for recruiting depending on your role. So for example, we have intermediary organizations on the phone, we have sponsors, we have single site supervisors, and we also have sub site supervisors that are joining us today. So depending on your role, you may have all of these pieces in the cycle that you're in charge of, or perhaps just some of the pieces. And so it's important just to know uh, where you fall and which of these pieces fall within your wheelhouse, so to speak. And as you've heard already from some of the examples, um, sometimes intermediary organizations recruit directly for their site, and sometimes sites recruit for their VISTAs. And sometimes it's a hybrid model, so um, the models vary across the country. 
but again, um, different people are involved at different points in the process. So that's part of figuring out your recruitment is figuring out what pieces you're really in charge of or would like to be um, involved with and communicating that with your partners. On top of the roles, we also know that the timeframes often shift in these kind of cycles and the action learning team uh, address that in their tools. So this is a cycle versus a continuum. That's why we have the circle. Um, because recruitment is an ongoing process, so once you have your members on board, it's time to sort of sit back and refine and reflect on your process and start planning for your next recruitment cycle. Um, always keeping in mind that it's a continuous process. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and transition back to Yalisa, and she's going to share some strategies for various points within the recruitment process. Take it away, Yalisa. Thank you, Amy. So our program loves recruitment, and it's probably one of our busiest seasons, and we actually have two separate cohorts that we bring in, one in the July, in July cohort and the other in November. So it really means that we're typically on recruitment all the time. But regardless that we only have a small lull in between transitioning cohorts and recruiting, we've learned a variety of different lessons across the year. First things first, planning. And when planning comes time, it's important to know that recruitment is labor intensive. It requires a lot of forward thinking and being really strategic about what exactly you need to get done. For example, calendaring out different dates for interviewing, setting the deadlines for that creation from your partners, opening up the national portal, setting up pre-screening of applications, and so on and so forth. Each of these areas can really make or break a successful recruitment, so it's important to make sure that you plan ahead of time so when the season does come to fruition, you have a, you have a plan already in action. Part of the way we've done this is actually we've created a program calendar, and before any season, midway through the year, we already update that calendar with all of our dates. Even if they're way ahead of time, we found that this just keeps us less stressed and less anxiety when it comes to recruitment and are able to be very strategic with our time. Marketing is huge. The only way that candidates are going to apply to your program is if they know about your program. Part of what our program has the benefit of, we're located in a college campus about 15 minutes north of the city of Albany. And in our area, we have nine different college campuses and a variety of community colleges. And what we've decided to create is called the College Tour. The College Tour provides our leaders and our VISTAs opportunities to host different informational tables and sessions to post to rising seniors or senior students who are about to graduate. And what we found is that through these tours, we've been able to build very solid relationships with career centers in our area and have found that they've been a very key asset in helping us to get the word to students. We've also found that through that networking over the years, we've been able to meet different faculty members or meet other administrators who encourage us to come in and do an informational session for their students or organizations. And as a result, the word has really spread. If you have any college campuses or universities in your area, I would highly recommend connecting with those administrators and begin getting your program out there. The next area that we work on is social media. And this, is a major, this has been a major recruitment for our program because the demographic that we typically have in our program starts ages 21 and up, and all of our candidates typically have a bachelor's degree. And as a result of that demographic who applies, we've recognized that one way they communicate is through social media. LinkedIn has honestly been our best friend. And I know my coordinator could agree with me. It definitely has brought out some solid outreach. And we never know who knows someone else. And we found that by writing a simple, simple blurb with major highlights of our program, with some easy to follow, where you can get more information and to a link to our website, has yielded some amazing candidates. So as a result, LinkedIn has tended to be a really great tool for us to use. Facebook has also been a great tool for us to use, but it tends to be more of a social site, and LinkedIn tends to be more of a professional network. So I would highly recommend for those programs who are interested, I would try the LinkedIn path first and see how that works for your program. 
Next is screening. Screening is a, is a, is a pretty labor-intensive process as well, and part of what we screen is really early on. Our program has created a candidate tracking database in which we actually take the candidate's application from eGrants, and we put in there the basic information of the candidate, including their name, their email address, their phone numbers, and even what time zone that they're in. And we start to keep track of what pieces of their applications they submit. Since we request additional supplemental application materials, such as a resume, cover letter, and essay questions, to help us to get to know the candidates better. And on this database, we also have notes. So the recruitment team here actually writes down the notes of their contact with the candidate. We typically do phone calls to candidates throughout the recruitment season to see if they have any questions. We host a variety of different informational sessions right out of our office, and we really try to touch base and get a sense and a pulse for the candidate to find out if they could potentially be a good fit. And what we find is that by taking these notes, we're able to communicate with each other where we've left off on a candidate. So if one of us picks up the next round of phone calls, we can reference a previous conversation and help us to better take a pulse on the interest of the candidate into our program. The next area is online application material collection. As I mentioned before, we do ask for some additional supplemental application materials from our candidates. And as a result, we found in the very beginning, we used to collect all these materials through email. As you can imagine, and being on a college campus, and I'm sure some other nonprofits can agree, email is a very popular form of communication. Therefore, we get inundated with email. The amount of traffic that we had with these materials was a lot and we realized that we needed a place where we could store this information in a shared space. And we decided to use an online application system, which is actually a survey system called Qualtrics, but some other programs may want to use um, Google Forms. And what we do is we have the candidates fill out and upload their resume and their cover letter and actually fill out the supplemental essay questions right on the form. And it sends an automatic trigger to us to let us know if they submitted it and it's in a shared area, so we can see all the candidates' materials in one spot rather than having it connected to someone's email account. If your program is interested in doing this type of process for application collection, I would highly recommend that you create a username and password that is generic to your program to allow you to be able to collect the materials and everyone can have shared access. Part of the issues that some programs face is that one person has all the materials, and if other people on the committee are trying to help, they may not be able to have access to it. And last but not least, the site placement. In our program, we have a very unique way of hiring. We first hire all of our VISTAs first, and they're welcomed into the Siena VISTA program, and then we have them participate in what we call speed networking interviews, also known as speed dating, with the nonprofits who are going to be given a VISTA placement from our program. This is definitely a labor-intensive part of our recruitment, but it tends to be the most successful. All of our VISTAs end up interviewing with every single placement in our program here on campus and in person if they're able to. If they can't make the commute and travel in person, they're able to do these interviews by phone. And we basically have everyone interview each other. The sites interview the candidates, and the candidates interview the sites and both parties are given all the application materials that they need in order to have a successful interview session with them. The interviews rotate at 25 minutes apiece with a break for lunch and an info session for the VISTAs and then reconvene in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, both the candidates and the site supervisor submit to us their ranking from their favorite candidate to the least and the candidates rank their favorite site to the least. And we take that information back to the office and we, do, we actually take that and do the matching sequence back here and release the information and let people know where they're serving by the end of the week. Um, it tends to take a lot of work in the initial beginning, but it is one of the most successful ways that we can place this many VISTAs in this many sites, since again, we have 25 different sites with 30 different VISTA positions. So I hope that this information was helpful for you, and as we continue on, Jenny has some also additional great information that can help make your recruitment successful. Thanks, Elisa, and congratulations to you. It sounds like you have a fantastic recruitment plan, and I learned a lot from listening to you speak.
Um, we have a lot of similar challenges but also strategies when we do recruitment. Um, our members are so we have 28 members and they're located all around the state of Michigan. So unfortunately, we can't get our VISTA candidates together or even our subsite supervisors in one place to do something like speed dating. So we really need to rely on email and phone to do more of our screening and placing. Um, I do have the ability to use, I have two VISTA leaders in my program and they're a great help with the recruitment process. So I turn a lot of the initial outreach over to the VISTA leaders and in addition to using social media, as Yelitsa mentioned, they also go to job fairs and they use word of mouth and really try to get the word out there to attract a high number of candidates because unfortunately you need a lot of candidates in order to fill the 28 positions that we have. Additionally, we use our subsites to do a lot of recruitment because we're based in Lansing and our subsites, as I said, are all around the state and we would really like to find a candidate who is more local. So using the subsite supervisors to also reach out and find some candidates has been really useful for us so we don't have to worry about people who are going to be relocating or who are unfamiliar to the community. One thing that I really like to do when we begin our recruitment plan is to figure out who's involved and what is their role. Sometimes other staff members at the Michigan Nonprofit Association are able to help with this process and we use their networks to try to reach out to potential VISTA candidates. As I mentioned, our VISTA leaders are involved and our subsite supervisors. So I want to know all of those people who are involved and what is their role. Additionally, the timeline is very important for us. Our biggest push for recruitment is in August, and then we have a few other small recruitments throughout the rest of the year. But for our big August start date, we really like to start recruiting five to six months in advance of that, because as I said, we like to have a lot of candidates, and we found that that's really necessary. So we need to know when that August PSO date is, and we can work backwards from there. We need time to recruit candidates, as well as do the first round interview with them run all of the background checks, then have time for the subsite supervisors to interview them, as well as check with their references. Something that has caught us off guard in the past is that our state office changed the date in which they would allow us to post the positions in the AmeriCorps portal. So it used to be that they would allow us to post our positions several months in advance, and then they changed it, and now we only have about six weeks before PSO to post our position in the AmeriCorps portal. So that's fine, but that means for us that we need to do a lot of outreach and not depend on the AmeriCorps portal very heavily for recruitment because that doesn't fit with our timeline very well for when we want candidates to be in our system. Another thing that we do during the planning stage is to draft emails to all of our candidates. Um, these are welcome emails or um, emails letting them know they did or did not get a position, emails requesting an interview. So we like to put all of those emails in writing and have templates so that during the big heavy recruitment push we can just fill in names and locations and we don't have to redraft all of the emails. So for us, the planning stage, the most important things are to create those templates as well as to reach out to our state office and figure out what their timeline looks like so we can work around that. Additionally, when we market um, the program, we try to really sell the program realizing that we are selling AmeriCorps Vista and we are selling our program just as much as those candidates are selling themselves to us. Sometimes this is a hard sell because we want people who are really excited about VISTA, not people who are only doing VISTA because they couldn't find anything better. So we want to let VISTA candidates know all about their benefits, like the living stipend and the Ed Award, excuse me, but we also want to focus on the training and professional development that they're going to receive, the great opportunity that they have to make a difference and get to know a community. We want to focus on the ability that they will have to network and that this is a great first step to many other positions because they're going to be in a nationally recognized program and doing great work in a community. So we want to make sure that we have a VISTA who's really excited about this and is then going to do a good job throughout the rest of the year. Many of you have already mentioned VISTA specific questions that you ask in an interview and we ask many of those as well. Like, is a candidate able to commit to a full year of service or is the candidate continuing to seek other employment opportunities? Do the candidates understand the living stipend? And what strategies will they have for living on that amount? And why do they want to do a year of national service? What are their goals for after the VISTA service and how can VISTA help them get there? In this process, we include the subsite supervisors as I mentioned. So myself and my VISTA leaders will do the first round interview and then 
we include those interview notes and the applicant's materials to the sub-site supervisor because we want to make sure that that sub-site supervisor, who's going to be working with the candidate on a day-to-day -day basis, feels really strongly and feels invested in this particular candidate. Finally, when we select a member, it doesn't end there. That's really the first step in a long relationship for us. So we want to make sure that the candidates know what they have coming up next and their timeline. So we want to make sure that they're getting in all of their paperwork, not only for us at the Michigan Nonprofit Association, but their paperwork for CNCS and in e-grants. If they're relocating, we we'll want to make sure that they're finding housing and taking care of their moving expenses and um, details. They should be continuing to interact with their sub-site supervisors and getting to know the organization and the community where they're going to be living and working. And we want to make sure that they're doing everything they need to for PSO, putting their loans into forbearance, applying for food assistance, figuring out their health insurance. We want to help them and continue to keep them engaged throughout that process. We don't want to lose someone in the interim between selecting them and when they actually start. So we have many touch points between when we select them and their PSO to make sure that they really understand what they've gotten themselves into and how they're going to continue to be engaged with our program. So that's how we work through the recruitment stages and techniques. And I believe I'm now turning it back to Amy. Great. Thank you again, Jenny and Yalisa. Some really helpful uh, behind the scenes ideas from folks that are doing the work on the ground. So let's uh, talk a little bit about tools. There's been a lot of chatter in um, discussion happening in the chat panel about tools. And I just wanted to give you an overview of a couple of the tools that the Action Learning Team created. Um, one of them is what they call In a Snap Recruitment Guide. And ideally, recruitment takes about four months. However, we all know that we don't always have the luxury of having four months. And so what they've done is they've outlined a SNAP, in a SNAP, sort of a quick way to recruit and get members on board if you have a short time period. And so that's one of the resources they created. And these are available now in the Action Learning Team project site on the VISTA campus, which is under Leaders. But like I said, we'll make sure that you have direct links to all these resources in the webinar page after the session. Probably take us about 48 hours to get all those files loaded up. One of the other resources that they created, similar to some samples that Yalitza was mentioning, is an applicant tracking tool. So that's a spreadsheet that they've put together for you guys to use. It's a template that includes sort of all the pieces you might need to track your applicants, and it includes instructions for the various cells so that you can take that Excel sheet, customize it for your program, and use it at your site. It's also one of those pieces that, that is useful when you have multiple recruiters and multiple people working to bring VISTAs on board. Another one that I'm really excited about is the VISTA recruitment calendar, and this is fantastic. It's a PowerPoint file that they have um, gone in and put in formulas so that what you can do is you can put the start date for your VISTA in, and then it populates the timeline for recruitment based on the start date, or you can use your PSO date. And that puts together a timeline for you so you don't have to start from scratch. And that's another one of the resources that we're really excited about. Um, I feel like the Action Learning Team did a really good job of trying to give you tools so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then one of the other pieces they did is the Frequently Asked Recruitment Questions, or FARC guide, which I think is a fun title for that. And this has a wealth of information, just things that you might want to know about recruitment. So if you're new to the VISTA recruitment process, this is a good place to start. Or if you're looking for some new ideas, you might want to check out the Frequently Asked Recruitment Questions. And there's a couple other tools that I'm not featuring, but we'll make sure that you have links to everything so that you can download these tools and use them at your site. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tracy Johnson from the corporation who's going to talk about marketing resources. Go ahead, Tracy. Thank you, Amy. I, um, I put this picture of the AmeriCorps VISTA pin up because it reminded me of a recent experience in the airport. So I was coming back from PSO, and as always, I wear the VISTA pin um, during that time period when I'm at the event. But while I was in the airport and getting a security check, 
um, the girl who was the TSA officer who was performing the check stopped me and said, oh, I did VISTA, and she had this whole conversation with me about um, what she did and how it changed her life and um, how it helped her career path. And so it was just a reminder of some, sometimes it's the simple things that can um, really facilitate the sort of conversations and, re, and name recognition that you need to not only um, stay in touch with people who have formally served, but entice new members to come on board. Which brings me to a conversation about co-branding. One of the things that um, both Yelitsa and Jenny mentioned in their conversations are the things that they're trying to do to get the word out, not only about their organization, but the VISTA experience itself. And so this is a great example that I saw through FIRST, which is a robotics program that VISTA is working with, where on their website, um, as you all know, the uh, My AmeriCorps portal doesn't give you the space that you may need to do a very um, broad description of your program. But you can easily use your website to do those things as well as co-brand that position with AmeriCorps. Um, and one of the things they did that was really creative was they used members that had served in the past or who are currently serving to create a short video that better explain what people would be doing. Um, I think a lot of times, even as a person who has done job searching myself, we are going to go to the Internet, try to find out more about an organization, and if you don't have a strong presence about what a VISTA, a potential VISTA member could expect, then they may move on to another organization that is better branded. So I thought FIRST was a great example of some simple things that you can do in utilizing the VISTAs that you currently have serving to help facilitate that effectively. Another thing that often happens is um, VISTAs will help spearhead some sort of um, program or initiative or some sort of event, um, for example, yesterday with the MLK Day events. I know lots of VISTAs across the country were working on great initiatives, and one way that you can help document some of those things that could be used for potential branding materials in the future is co-brand with the AmeriCorps VISTA logo. So all of your VISTA members should have a pin and a VISTA t-shirt that they were given through um, PSO. Allow them to wear those materials and so that the photographs not only show your brand with the signage that you have up for your organization, but also have some VISTA logos shown as well so that you can use those photos on social media, you can put them on your website as you're trying to recruit for new members so that those people who are Googling your organization, which we know they will do um, when they're looking into this opportunity, that these sort of images will pop up and they'll get a better sense of the sort of things that you're doing. Additionally, if you're doing an event and you're trying to get press there and you're mentioning the work that the VISTA member will be doing, go ahead and put some boilerplate language about VISTA at the bottom of that press release or or that media advisory so that when the write-up comes out, it um, gives a little bit more of a description beyond just saying that you have a VISTA member on board. Now people in the public, again, when they're looking more into what those opportunities are, they'll get more insight into the program itself and how it all ties back together. To help you in doing those things, we know that um, you may not already have access to VISTA logos and those sort of things, and that's why we have them all available for digital download on our nationalservice.gov website. Um, we also have other free promotional materials that have already been created. So if you don't have someone in-house or VISTA who can help you utilize our logos to create new um, new information or new fact sheets and things of that nature. You can utilize the materials that we already have created, and all these materials are free for you. Um, you can download them or you can order them. We try to make them as accessible as possible. We also have 
ways to connect with us on social media. So let's, again, let's say that you're doing an event and you're using a hashtag um, about this great project that your VISTA is doing. Feel free to utilize um, our or shout out some of our social media networks while you're doing that. So if you're big on Twitter, use the at Vista Buzz handle, or if you're doing some, something on LinkedIn, what Elisa said is very popular, make sure that you're incorporating that with the AmeriCorps Vista groups on LinkedIn because we would be more than happy to help cross-promote those things for you and make the, the workload a lot easier. And I know a lot of times when you're doing your daily routines that that might slip your mind, but I hope that when you're reviewing all these materials that you come back to this page and just take a look at the various resources that we do have available to you and try to figure out ways moving forward where you can incorporate us um, in your marketing so that the stronger that we are creating a brand for VISTA, the stronger it will be when you're branding the opportunities you have for VISTA positions with your organization. Thank you, Amy. Great. Thank you so much, Tracy. And I know um, it's really helpful to have all these resources available. And I'm guessing that there are some people that didn't know they existed. So we really appreciate you sharing all of these resources that are available to order for folks, as well as just going on and getting logos, which is very nice to be able to access that online. So let's go ahead and talk. We are, I know we're bumping up at the top of the hour. We've had some really great conversations. But we want to talk a little bit about challenges and solutions in our time that we have left. And I want to thank everybody that uh, submitted questions and challenges when you registered. At this time, we're going to go ahead and just open it up. And you can put in the chat panel, what's your biggest recruitment challenge? What has been a creative solution for your program? Maybe you have a question for Yalitza or Jenny or Tracy. So go ahead and use the chat panel to uh, ask your questions or share your ideas. I also want to point out that Lois just shared with us the link to the supervisor forums on the VISTA campus. And that is really um, your place to share ideas with each other. Um, if you haven't been on the forums, I encourage you to continue this conversation around recruitment on the VISTA supervisor forums. And they're pretty easy to use. You just have to go in and sign up on the VISTA campus. So let's go ahead and see uh, what we have for questions. Let's see. Well, I see one person has mentioned uh, the, the challenge of recruiting in a rural area. Yeah, and we've heard that time and again. And um, one idea that I've heard from some VISTA supervisors is that when they market their opportunities in rural areas, they try to market them as a domestic adventure. So you won't just be serving in this tiny town in Montana. You get to go on this domestic adventure into this beautiful, wild, and scenic place in order to serve people in VISTA. So I know that's a kind of a quick answer, but that's one way to sort of flip the way that you uh, advertise is by really trying to make it sound like something that is an opportunity they may never be able to get again. What other ideas have people heard for recruiting in rural areas? You can type your ideas into the chat panel. Uh, one of the one of the um, comments was about um, getting subsites to adhere to the time frames and to actually work with subsites in the recruiting process. Quite a few rural. And Jenny or Sisa, anybody want to jump in on any of these questions? Um, you're welcome to. Sure. I know that there, um, one of the questions that I saw was about the timeline and PSO, and we've had to get really creative with that as well. Our July PSO tends to be the one with the highest amount of candidates applying because in our area, it's, it's well, first, it's a lot easier to move in our area during the summer months. 
November, December, we're already creeping into old man winter season. Um, so it tends to have a lot of snow here in our area. And there's not as much turnover in the apartment complexes. We have a lot of apartments um, in our area. So that tends to be a challenge. Um, my coordinator and I recognized that we had our timeline starting in September to recruit with um, a month of recruitment plus interviews and selection in early October and getting them ready to come in by November. And it was hard, and I do agree with those, especially in those odd months where maybe the type of candidate you want doesn't necessarily, it may not be there. Um, what we found is really utilizing a lot of our resources, a lot of word of mouth, having our alumni reach out and let people know of their interest. Um, utilizing career centers was a big thing. Um, HEOP programs, which are higher education opportunity programs, um, reaching out to them as well. So we've really had to get really diverse with it, and we recognize that we do need more time for the November cohort because it does require more attention. Our July cohort tends to be very popular because we're targeting a lot of about to be recent grads. Um, so I would say for those of you who are in the winter months, I really recommend um, spending some time looking at your resources in your area and really utilizing word of mouth and a lot of your connections from your Vista alumna to really get some more interest um, in your application pool. Thank you. So I realize that we're about two minutes past and we promised to get you guys out of here on time and I've already broken that promise. Um, there's a lot of energy in the chat panel, and what I would like to see is if folks could continue that conversation on the VISTA Supervisor Forum. You may need to log into the campus first and then copy that link and paste it into your browser. You can also find them very easily by going to the VISTA campus, going to the Supervisor section, and clicking on the VISTA Supervisor Forum. And we'll be sure that that link is also available with the recording. Um, I want to, first of all, just notice and appreciate our wonderful co-presenters today who did a great job of sharing their ideas and tips. And as we wrap up for the day, I just want to remind you to complete the evaluation for the webinar. There will be an evaluation that comes up that pops up from WebEx. Feel free to give WebEx some feedback if you want to. And then our session evaluation will come up after that. So please let us know how we did today and also reflect a little bit on uh, what you experienced during the session. So I want to, again, thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you on our next webinar in uh, February that's going to focus on retention. Thank you, everyone, and have a great week.